Good evening, guys. Felix here. Welcome to this live stream. It's a good day for Palantir today. It's also a good day for tech stocks. And we're going to dig into that. As always, guys, feel free to ask all the questions you want. I'll do my utmost to answer them all. This is very much a, a Q&A. This is not just a, a, a man with a microphone who can talk at you. So don't be shy, guys. As always, though, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only. Please bear that in mind. And also uh, bear in mind to destroy that like button. I truly appreciate that as well. So um, Palantir, of course, fantastic news on the contract. We're going to go through that in just a second. Before we do, we should have a quick look at some inflation numbers that came in today. We have the um, uh, Michigan inflation numbers uh, out a, the expectations rather out and they are lower than was forecast uh, and that is therefore a good thing because that's what you want because growth stocks get hammered uh, when inflation goes up and at this point uh, future markets looking rather positive and we will of course also look at live here the market has just opened two minutes ago so let's have a look at uh, what all of our lovely growth stocks are doing here. Palantir up 2.7%, uh, which is just fantastic. And um, BlackBerry up. Uh, okay, that's, that's quite substantial. We have to look in, into why that is. Uh, Lee Auto up. Most of the tech stocks are looking rather green here. Uh, what's suffering? Um, the banks a little bit. That makes sense. Um, XPang, I'm not quite sure why. Coin, did, did Bitcoin take another tumble? Uh, before while I haven't looked yet back down to 36,000 so that would explain coin um, otherwise I think we're going to see a fairly good day today Fridays uh, can sometimes be erratic but the inflation expectations I think will be somewhat lowered here uh, which is which is positive um, now we are getting today also the president's 2022 budget so that's going to be a major item there and that should be a major boost for evs especially for us evs but also really the whole sector so i think that is quite good um personal spending was on target personal income month on month it's down but it is down less than was expected so that's also good so overall i think these numbers are are, are fairly um we can live with these, <laughs> I would say. I think these are these are pretty decent numbers. Uh, so, guys, let's let's talk about Palantir here. Then, uh, where is the lovely announcement here? It was awarded a 111 million US dollar contract to provide mission command platform for the US Special Operations Forces, and this is now a pretty long relationship that they've had with the US Special Ops. So, we were all expecting a contract renewal here, but it is interesting to see what the details are, and then we look a little bit at the history of these contracts as well. Um, so, the contract is valued at 111 million, inclusive of options, with 52.5 million executed upon award. The total contract includes a base year and one option year. Um, for some reason, it seems, guys, there is no chat on. Let me just see if I can do something about that because there should be a live chat on enabler. Okay, let me just disable it and then I'll enable it again because I can't see it, guys. Um, there we go. Okay, I think I think that might work now. So feel free, guys, to um, uh, try to write something here. I, I can't see it so far, which is really rather odd. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me write something so you guys can see that. Um, so it, it, they're using basically Palantir's platform has been used by Usocom in real time mission operations to interoperate with other components of the global situational awareness architecture. That's a lot of long words, isn't it? Since 2016. And Palantir software is designed to aggregate disparate and siloed data sources to enable the best possible data-driven decision-making, making Palantir uniquely uh, suited for um, well, high-impact decision-making, and you have those in, in wars. So when special ops are risking their lives with no in no-fail scenarios, they deserve technology that works. Our partnerships was one of the first with the US military, and we are honored to keep providing technology that gets the job done while we partner on the future of what is possible, says uh, Palantir here. And... Um, so it's, a, it's used for the full cycle of today's continuous operations from planning to reviews, approvals, 
which is the bottle, battle tracking of the actual missing uh, mission execution here. Uh, and they've been doing that now for a decade. And that's pretty interesting that that continues. It just goes to show the trust. And this here is um, our, all the contracts that USOCOM, the US Special Operations Command, have issued to Palantir over the last couple of years. They're in no particular order, but you can see here 2018, it was 51 million. And there are these little sort of top ups. In 2020, we got 35 million, 10 million again in 2020, um, 52 million again in 2018, uh, and so on. Some of these are zero. I guess these are maybe options being um, being um, triggered. 2017, it was 23 million. Again, 2020, another 14 million. And then 200 19,000 in 2020. So these are some smaller numbers here, 20 million, 2016. So this is a pretty sizable number. Uh, judging by the history of this, this looks to me like it is the biggest one uh, yet, slightly bigger than the 51 million, well, substantially bigger than we got in 2018. So this matters. And this is super important because this is the backbone of Palantir, the total addressable market of the US defense contracts that they might get are something like, I read an article on this earlier, which I thought was rather accurate. Um, I think it's 126 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, it's 26 billion. And that's the current addressable market here. So uh, if they get a quarter of that, uh, 26 times um, 0.25 is 6.5 billion. And what do we have in our discounted cash flow models? What is the prediction? Well, we have about 9, 10 billion by 2030. And they're telling us by 2025, they expect 4 billion in revenue. So with just with these government sort of defense contracts, they can quite easily get there. Uh, and I, I expect they will. Guys, if you are writing in the chat, I truly appreciate it. For some reason, I, I cannot see it. Uh, for that, I apologize. Actually, let me see if I look on my phone. Maybe I can see it. There seems to be some little YouTube uh, bug in here but if I watch myself then maybe I can maybe I can see your comments because it is always a lot more fun when I can answer your questions okay brilliant guys I can see them on here I just have to occasionally look down here so um uh, good morning all you guys here roti boy I see a lot of familiar faces muscle doc um which is fantastic to see you uh, Robert long time no see great to have you on the chat Bob uh, and everybody else. So I can't see your chat now. I'll just uh, uh, cheat on my phone every once in a while. So I'll, I'll lean that against my, my mug here. So I, I can see you guys. So, so do feel free to write uh, questions and comments. I will see them. I'll just sort of peek down and I'm watching myself. I should stream myself watching myself, shouldn't I? Wouldn't that be more interesting? Uh, so actually, this U the US defense contracts, as they're saying, are massive for Palantir. It will get them to about 60% of their revenue targets easily for the current valuations. And these valuations give us a fair price target of $60. So it would actually require very little growth of Foundry. And Palantir have said that they expect Foundry in the long run to be the biggest part of their business by far. Why? Because there are a lot more companies out there than there are governments in the long run, right? So that addressable market is much, much bigger. Yes, there is some competition, it's Microsoft or whoever else, but Palantir will still pick up a sizable market and they only have to pick up a tiny percentage amount of this whole AI data business in the US to get and smash their expectations here. Um, uh, Gregory, thank you very much. Uh, you have been very kind here. Uh, Palantir seems to be at a major resistance at 23.75. So let's have a look at the chart here, guys. So you see this red line I put in here that sort of trends downwards. That was connecting uh, the previous highs. Um, and that was sort of, I was saying yesterday, if we break through that, uh, then we leap out of it because we sort of struggled. We struggled also to get through this blue line here, which is the 50 day moving average. And now we've gone through that. We've smashed that. We've smashed our kind of downward trajectory here. And what are we doing now? Well, we have to basically go back up to uh, our last peak, which is that faint blue line here at sort of 24.25. So let me put in a little number in here. Uh, this one here, 24, 27, uh, you know, a cent or two doesn't really matter. So that's what we need to smash through. And we've really done that today. So the market has actually paid attention because this contract is sizable enough. 111 million, 
is you know more than 10 percent of of uh, of turnover right uh, what was the turnover last year at one point oh nine so it's exactly it's really much exactly 10 percent of revenue so this stuff really matters and the fact that these are sticky contracts that they get bigger and bigger over time really matters and that's why palantir is up five and a half percent today so the sell-off uh, was perhaps overdone uh, but for me actually i like to buy things on the way up momentum is really turning around we had a beautiful growth day yesterday we saw down here let me point it with an arrow can you see down there that great big green bar? Uh, that is a big juicy buy day. That means volume is up. The price stock is going up. That means there is momentum in that rally. And it's the opposite of what we've been seeing this last 10 days or so. So this is good news. Now, the real question is, can we break out above 2427? Because that would take us above the previous peak. And that's going to act as a serious resistance level here. And um, then, you know, we have a chance to go back into the $25 range. But at the moment, that's really what we're testing here. Um, Fernando, good morning to you too. Uh, Eric, great to have you on the chat here, guys. If you think, why, why is he staring at his phone? It's because the, 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 the your YouTube chat it doesn't seem to be working on the screen. So I'm looking at that. Uh, do you guys feel free to shout out questions, whether it's Palantir related or not? Uh, you're very, very welcome to do that. Uh, let's have a quick look again on what the market is doing here. Ehang really flying. They're, they have literally flying. They've announced a long distance drone. I might do a video on that, guys, if you're interested. Uh, that's quite an interesting move. So they don't no longer just have the EH216, which is that sort of two people passenger drone, but they now have a, a longer haul model, uh, which is good. So Palantir here really near the top of the of the market uh, flying here. Lee also also up, Xpang up, Neo up a percent and a half, uh, Square, PayPal. I think the market's coming around that it's going to be a green day here. I don't know why Facebook's down half a percent, but perhaps that's a little bit of rotation, putting people put, pulling money out of the safer tech into the more exciting tech. Now, I wouldn't recommend selling Facebook, to be honest with you. I think it's a great company, but uh, I think that's a little bit what's happening here. Uh, Bitcoin at 37,000 as we speak, still not quite getting through the 40,000. I wish it would, because it would really make my portfolio look a little bit better. Uh, Rody Boy says, yes, please do a video on eHang. Okay, thanks, guys. I'll make a note on that. I used to cover eHang quite a bit, and then the, the sort of power went out of it because of that uh, short hit that they had. A lot of people lost confidence. So there wasn't really a lot going on there. Um, have you seen Tom Nash's latest video about Skywise Foundry in action, Eric Chow? Now, uh, no, I have not. Uh, I will ask Tom uh, what he's what he's what he's up to on Skywise. Oh, actually, I think I might. Did I watch that? Is he sort of saying that the valuation of that is is is, is ludicrously high and Palantir is ludicrously low, and that Palantir should be valued a lot more? I, I think they. Uh, I think that's maybe what he said. But I, I'll check it out later. I, I like Tom. Uh, CH, did you consider BlackBerry a meme stock? No, not really. And and why? Because, okay, it is being picked up by this whole, you know, Wall Street bets, GameStop sort of Reddit madness and mania. And that isn't really great for, for BlackBerry, quite frankly, because uh, they are they're kind of a startup in an old company. So they're sold off... Um, loads of uh, hang on we just got the uh, pmi in here uh, reported that 75 consensus was 68 okay uh, that is uh, not too bad um let's just have a look here uh, all the bar business bar barometers are looking relatively positive there okay that isn't the biggest news in the world so i think e hang uh, sorry blackberry Forget about them being, you know, an old phone company. I used to have a BlackBerry. I absolutely loved it. They're getting rid of all of that. They've sold off most of those patents and they are becoming a sort of data security company. And that's what they're doing. Now, uh, why on earth they are flying up like they are? I think that is speculation. Uh, you don't normally get three days in a row, sort of 10, 5, 10% growth like that. That isn't really fundamental. So that's the cautiousness I have with this is, uh, you know, what is it actually worth? It's a little bit hard to tell at the moment because people are are, are doing some silly business with BlackBerry. Um, uh, Dab for less, good morning. Uh, great to see you on the chat. Um, you are SOCOM tweet from Palantir. Uh, great. Okay, we'll have a look at, at, at Twitter. 
see what's what's going on over there. Um, Palantir that's been selected by Usacom. Yes, we were just talking about that, literally, uh, which is, of course, absolutely fantastic. Uh, that is is very, very good news indeed. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll do a quick recap on that in, in a second. Um, I know you're not a fan of Plug. Do you know why it's up today? <laughs> absolutely no idea. Uh, but, you know, just because I'm not a fan doesn't mean I don't follow stuff. Uh, let's have a quick look at Plug, see if we can uh, figure out, at least if there's anything in the news uh expected notice from nasdaq that was a little while ago uh, because they were failing to file stuff so no i don't really know why plug is up today um i mean they have certainly been beaten rather hard uh but it is it is it is i think it's a fairly speculative stock i mean anything with that kind of level of volatility then let's just put plug in here so we can get a, get a decent chart but no, I honestly don't know. And I think that's sometimes the weird thing with these stocks that have these massive price movements without any real news. Now we had, no, earnings are about to come out according to this. And they were out, 28th. Today's the 28th. Maybe the earnings are out. I haven't seen them yet, uh, but maybe maybe that's what it is. Or people are buying on expectations of good earnings. I think I think that probably has something to do with it. So it might be less speculative and more real world, uh, provided the accountant was any good. Um, 111 million plus renewals. Gary Cowan says yes, absolutely fantastic. I agree with you. Uh, we have here 111 million. And why do these contracts matter even more than a normal contract? Because U.S. special operations, the um, you know, nuclear weapons stockpile, those kind of things are the most sensitive things that the US government has, right? There is nothing more risky than sending a bunch of guys into a very dangerous situation. You want to make sure that the software you have is the absolute best you have in the country, that it works absolutely all the time, because if it doesn't, you're going to lose some people. People are going to die needlessly. So the trust you have here, I think, is, is, is the fundamental basis to the growth we are going to get in U.S. government spend expenditure. I think Palantir is going to hoover up somewhere between 5 and 10 billion U.S. dollars of revenue per year in, in, in government expenditure. I think they're going to get that. It's headed for $25. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, I think I think you are, you're right there on Palantir. I think we are heading that way. Uh, what was our real resistance from the next peak? Let's zoom in just a little bit here. Uh, I think it was 24, 27. Uh, that's actually our previous peak. So that's the one we need to crack through. Now, the moment that is acting as a resistance here. Can you see that there? We touched on it. We touched that blue line and then we came back down. So that is the resistance, exactly as, as I was saying. Uh, what's going on with inflation? Okay, we've got a bunch of numbers out today, uh, which I've got here on the screen. So uh what are the most exciting ones here well we have uh, the michigan consumer sentiment is a little bit better um which is good and bad um, the inflation expectations however are lower uh, and that is important and the five-year inflation expectations are also lower than expected and then forecast and inflation is all about expectation if you expect inflation you're going to get inflation, right? And that's the only thing central banks really do is they try to create an expectation of what they want the market to do. It's much less about fundamentals. They just do something to make you believe that something that they want to happen is going to happen here. So I think these inflation numbers are therefore less than expected. 2.7 versus 3.1% expected. 3.4% versus, uh, sorry, we haven't got these ones out yet. These are, uh, apologies guys, these are not actual numbers. Ignore what I just said on that here. Um, the um, the PCE price index, this is the personal consumption expenditure price index. It rose a little bit, but it rose a little bit less than expected. Um, personal spending month on month is on target. And the income, uh, that's actually the, the, the number I was looking for. Income is down but not down as much as we thought so it's kind of good for the economy uh, but at the same time uh, i i think our 
um, price indices are a little bit lower than expected. So I don't think we're going to get massive inflation fears today. Uh, we are going to get some numbers out in about nine minutes. So we're going to be interested to see what the Michigan expect expectations are. Apologies, guys, I thought they were out already. Uh, they're out in nine minutes. The other big macro news today is the president's 2022 budget, which is going to be a whopper and it's going to throw lots of money at EVs. So I think it is going to be good uh, for EVs. Um, In, okay, Roger is saying in reverse head and shoulder. Are you talking about Palantir? Uh, where is your head and your shoulder? Talking about this sort of thing up there? Or are you thinking another one? Okay, sorry, I, I, I don't quite see it. It might well be there, but I don't quite see it. Are you talking about plug? Okay. Eugene, welcome to the channel. Muscle Dog is talking about uh, NVIDIA. Let's pull that up. Um, when our lovely members and Patreons talk about uh, things, guys, I, of course, I, I have to prioritize them. Uh, Master Dog is a loyal follower here. So uh, this is, you're, you're right, it, it has been flying up quite substantially in the last 10 days or so. Um, it's running up pre-stock split, yes. I mean... It ran up, but it didn't run up so far as high as the, the previous peak, right? So uh, that's always what I look for is, you know, if this is indeed the peak of this, this rally, then we are trending down a little bit, right? So we are sort of forming a, um, let me just move this up a little bit here. We are forming a bit of a triangle here. There's something like this, this sort of situation uh, where, you know, at the moment, this is keeping a lid on it, this top red line here. If you break through that, that's when you get a real bounce. Uh, but we are trading substantially above the, I think that's the 50-day moving average line. Uh, let's make that the 100-day uh, the line here for a second. Let's see where that would put us. Yeah, also, obviously, that's a little bit lower. Um, so I, I, my, my thought would be on this. Uh, and that might well, well uh, of course, change. But given that this is trading like this for four days in a row, four days slightly lower highs, I wouldn't bet on a real rally here coming out of NVIDIA at these price points. Uh, I would aim to buy this below the 100-day moving average line. So below the blue line here, uh, if you can get it down here or down there, if you want to buy a a a NVIDIA, uh, that is a much better price point than when we are substantially above it. Um, so that, that would, would be my thought on that. Um, Hashtag to my president. Uh, fair enough. Less. That's the way democracy works, unfortunately. Uh, there is uh, half the time somebody in the office that you don't want. Um, uh, BNTX, uh, someone shouting out here. I say somebody, it is Turbo, uh, who's saying BioNTech, a beautiful pattern. Well, 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 it is, it is a lovely pattern. It is definitely a sustained, uh, nice rally here. Uh, that is, uh, well... It's 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 sort of tempting to grow draw a little chart here, but a channel here. You are sort of on this, you know, this kind of a channel here that continues to, well, I mean, let's do it sort of roughly to sort of go in that direction. So very 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 much a growth trajectory, but there is a small but here. And what's that? The but is volume down here falling off. So be careful because when you get beautiful rallies at the top. Uh, so, you know, we're starting here where volume really starts to fall off from that line. Can we get a horizontal line in here? There we are. So, you know, all of this growth here, right? At the same time, your volume is going in the opposite direction. What does that tell you? Well, one thing I teach you in my course, guys, is a lot of technical analysis because it's important. And this is saying to you, this is likely uh, near, near, near the top of one, uh, near, the, near the peak, because your volume continues to fall off. So it's important to understand that. And as, on that note, guys, check out the course coupon below, 39% off. And the coupon code is FREEDOM for big, fat, juicy financial freedom. And that expires at the end of Sunday. Uh, that's New York Eastern time. So get in there before you can. And you have a complete no questions asked 100% refund policy from me uh, because people like the product and I trust that it's a great product. So I encourage you to check that out. I think you can learn, learn, learn quite a lot there. Of course, not just technical analysis, but a lot of fundamentals, how to make your discounted cash flow models, how to invest in times of inflation, uh, how to put together a good long-term portfolio and, and much, much, much more. Um, uh, Roger, thank you very much. Um, 
uh, Cosman is talking about uh, Tom Nash's new video, uh, talking about uh, Foundry. Um, we were started the call here, thank you very much, uh, Cosman, saying that Foundry, according to Palantir, is going to be the biggest part of their business. Um, and that makes sense because, yes, they might get, say, six billion US dollars of US government money, and they'll also get more and more government money in Europe. But of course, there are much, much more, many, many more corporations out there, and the corporations actually make money out of using Foundry. Find me another piece of software that makes companies money. Very, very, very rare. Uh, and that is really why people like to pay for it, because they pay less than they get. So they're happy to roll it out. And it just takes a little bit more time because they're newer to the sector. They've only just hired 50 salespeople. Uh, but they're telling us the pipeline is two and a half times fuller than it was. So I do expect some pretty great uh, things there as well. Um, Alexei is saying, I bought reached previous peak i bought it at 18 dollar dip could you say if i should sell well it really depends on your perspective if you want to make some short-term profits by all means um and i know some palantir fans are going to shout at me for this because they say you should never say palantir sell palantir but look guys it depends on everyone's horizon right some people invest because they want the money in the short run and they needed to pay for something in which case taking profits is a good thing there's also nothing dirty about taking profits you could also, if you wanted to, take out your original investment or half of your original investment, and that's pure profit. You've got that back now, and then you're left with some free Palantir stock. It really depends on your on your horizon. Uh, or you wait this thing out like five or ten years, and you take your long-term profits, but that really depends on your personal financial situation. But I do always encourage people to take some profits if they need them. Uh, or if they cannot tolerate volatility over long periods of time. Now, if you've got lots of money flowing in from three different businesses and you know you don't know what to do with the stuff, it's just everywhere, then you know you want to keep staying in, in, in stocks that you believe are fundamentally going to perform uh, well in, in the long run. Uh, so it, 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 I'm going to throw the question a little bit back at you there, uh, Alex. Say, um, you know, you made you you went from 18 to 24 dollars. Uh, that is six over 18, which even I can do in my head. Uh, that's 35 percent. That's a pretty great return. So there's nothing wrong with locking in some of those profits or all of those profits and then starting again, or you know, waiting for the next dip because there will be a dip. There always is, no matter what happens in the market. There will be a day again with inf more inflation fears, where people will panic and will be irrational, and you can make money out of those things. Look, just look at the chart here that I've got on the screen, right? You can make money on trading those things. There's nothing wrong with it. I know some people just think you should hold on to stocks like some sort of religion. Um, I buy a lot of stocks that I never sell. I just keep buying and buying and buying, but I'm in a fortunate situation that I don't need to sell them. I, I, I'm able to hold those things for 10 years or 20 years or longer. And that's my, my compounding growth strategy there. Um, where are my holders at, Sir Sebastian? Absolutely, we're getting some diamonds hands. Uh, I, I appreciate that, guys. Um, uh, Palantir, my retirement account, <laughs> says Roger. Um, I'm a long-term holder, says Alex. Say, just looking for more dips. Okay, uh, well, then, you know, I, th I think you've kind of answered your question there. Uh, the, it really depends on everyone's time horizon, as I say. Some people uh, day trade, some people trade for, for, for the forever horizon. Um, I'm, I'm more in that camp there. Diamond hands to the moon, says Alexei there. Um, Baba, SEC, let's go. Um, and Eric, you have a very good question there. When you sell, when you put the money, do you have another investment that is better than this stock? And how do you know if it's better? Well, you've done your research. You've read the income statements. You understand the business. You understand the moat. You've done a discounted cash flow model. And if all of that sounds impossible to you guys, um, I, I teach you that. I teach you that in my course. Uh, you can check it out uh, and you can see all of the lessons uh, on here, including, you know, discounted cash flow model templates and everything. It isn't difficult, actually. In fact, I actually had it up here earlier because I was showing it to somebody. I show you here on screen, actually a lecture for my course. On the left are data from Tesla. On the right is the template that I give you. And I hold your hand through what data goes where and what assumptions go where and where you can find that data that's accurate for free and really, really implore people to do uh, those uh, kind of 
models because you don't truly understand a stock until you've done a discounted cash flow model on it. And it isn't complicated, it really isn't. People like to make it sound difficult because they want to sell them or they want to sound like an expert. Uh, I, I try to take the, the fluff and the difficulty out of it. Um, now we should have, guys, some economic numbers out here. Uh, so Michigan five-year inflation expectation numbers were at 3%. We were expecting 3.1, so that's slightly lower. And the um, that's the five-year inflation expectation. And the shorter-term inflation expectation came in at 4.6, which is exactly what we expected. That's good news because that's basically no news, slightly lower than expected on the on the five year. So uh, that, that's good. That that is uh, is positive and that is going to uh, help underpin the market here. And look how green things are. Palanty up eight um, percent. Now, is that an overreaction? Yes, in the sense that I think on the next trading day or perhaps even throughout the day, that number is probably going to come down somewhat because very rarely do stocks go up 8%, 10% and hold that on the next trading day because why people want to take profits. People like Alexei here are asking themselves, hang on, I made 35%. Shouldn't I take some of that and you know buy something with it? And that's people's mindset. And again, super important to understand the psychology of investors so you can make money out of it because you can predict what people are going to do. Again, something else I teach you in my course, guys. So, um, nice camera upgrade, says Philco. Thank you. Actually, I'm, I'm experimenting with some different lighting. Uh, so, Philco, thank you very much for that there. Um, uh, Calvin, okay, we just covered inflation. So, it came in the expectations from, uh, from Michigan are slightly lower or on target will be expected. So, that's good news. Um, did Wall Street short Palantir? Is it heavily shorted? Not particularly, to be honest with you. Uh, there isn't a great deal. Actually, I can show you a... Uh, let me pull this up for you. Um, Palantir here. Finviz is quite a good site if you want to just get up a number here. So short float is 6.4%. Now that's up. It is. I did put a video out on that, I think, yesterday. Uh, here's on our Discord. You can see... Guys, we were at 4.6% uh, short interest of, of float, and it's gone up to 6.4%. Now, these filings are always retrospective, so they are filing them after the fact. And where did it come from? Well, can you see that here, guys? I hope it's big enough. Um, we had quite a lot of institutional investors buying puts. So, uh, you know, Goldman's, Nomura, lots of, lots of uh, basically... Uh, banks uh, buying puts, Bank of America, UBS, etc., is City. Uh, and why did they do that? Because this filing is from the last quarter. Uh, we were at a peak of a market. Uh, they were expecting inflation. They were expecting growth stocks to hit, get hit hard. So they want to make money. They want to make money in all directions. So they made, they kept their shares. They held on to them. They just bought some puts. Stock price goes down. They make their money. They still hold their shares. They're happy, right? Everyone's happy. So that's what you can do. And that's a good strategy to do because you make money. If you expect the market to go down, there's nothing wrong with making money in both directions. Uh, Stefan, okay, you're sharing with us about a lock, COVID lockdown, you and Guangzhou. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that, Stefan. Um, I, I hope it's it's not too serious over there. In Hong Kong, we've had zero cases today. So uh, things are looking pretty, pretty good here. Um, um, Philco is saying BlackBerry, I did not know, was involved in the meme stock squeeze. Philco, normally you tell me what is going on with BlackBerry. Uh, Philco is our resident BlackBerry expert on our Discord channel. Let's have a quick look at how short float is 9%. So, yeah, not massively. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a short squeeze. I think it's a bit of, uh, of enthusiasm from that particular group of retail investors. Um, Palantir is now up 9%, which is, of course, super fantastic. Uh, I think we deserve that for our patients. Buy more Palantir, says Cosman. Um, Akash is asking, what do you think about the uranium bull market? Um, okay, uranium, obviously, ingredient in, uh, in, in nuclear power stations. The whole thesis is that everything is going electric, right? So we're going moving away from fuel to electricity. Where does the electricity come from? Okay, a lot of people are saying green energy and stuff, but there are issues with that. We need a lot more batteries, we need a lot more storage, uh, and therefore there will be likely be more nuclear power. And I, I think that's probably correct. 
and people are therefore buying uranium uh, and, and you know whether it's the commodity the futures or mines now they have been quite cheap for some time because it's a pretty hideous thing to invest in basically uranium miners die of uh, of cancer uh, and they i think have a 50 percent higher chance of dying of lung cancer than coal miners so it's it's not a great group to be in and it's a pretty unpleasant business and that's why a lot of the institutions and funds have stayed clear of that but there are people who've been pushing this for the last year or two so i think it's 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 a it's it's a reasonable story uh, hey man um <laughs> great to see you and great of you to say hi um, uh, John Bend uh, wants to uh, short my videos uh, and wants me to stop with the ridiculous clickbait. Well, it got you here, didn't it? Uh, so somehow it worked. Um, although I think I think this particular title wasn't clickbaited in any any way, shape, or form at all. I just put out the contract value, which is totally true. I should have done something a bit more dramatic, right? More flames and explosions. Um, Volume today is looking pretty nice. I am with you on that, uh, says Cosman here. I've got 25 million here at the moment. Let me have a look at the uh, the live. Oh, no, you are right. 40 million here. This is the second by second live feed I, I subscribe for. Uh, so, yeah, absolute massive volume here on, on the way up. Um, we need to wait for June for real inflation data, says Leo. Yeah, and you know what? That could be another great buying opportunity because if they are a little bit higher than expected, people are going to uh, thrash the growth market again. So good timing to time our, our buys. Um, uh, 8.4% up. Wow, nice to see. We'll settle down. I'd imagine green days are nice on Friday. Zero sum, I agree with you. It's a very nice way to round up the weekend. Apologies, guys. I'm reading off my phone here because the, the, the YouTube chat thing doesn't work so i, I don't, don't mean to be rude but it's the only way i can i can see you guys um um uh andrew uh felix got him good morning la jolly great to see you ciao uh, or wow perhaps um great to see you on the chat here 28 dollars by the end of the day says michael uh, wow that's pretty ambitious there michael that would be another 20 percent. i think in a day that seems a little bit uh, ambitious but uh, we can get there in the end um palantir now is like buying tesla at ten dollars says eugene uh, the title is actually true says bob yes <laughs> there's something wrong with that one right you know what tom nash said to me he said to me um, you, you you really need to make some do some clickbait you are so conservative with your titles so i'm taking some inspiration there um uh, Carmeno is not happy with Barba because it's not going anywhere. I'm not happy with Barba either. I don't really know anybody who is happy with Barba. And yes, I think the underlying business should go. It should be in the 300s at least, uh, but it's not really going anywhere. And now, OK, Barba is kind of out of the woods of all this regulation stuff. But now Tencent is next and Mate One is next and everybody else. So people there, therefore, are now reflecting the bad news for Tencent onto the whole sector and it sort of hits Barber again. So this whole Chinese tech sector isn't really going to go anywhere, I think, in the next couple of months. Uh, I think we're just going to have to accept that uh, and, and either be staying it for the long run uh, or, uh, or uh, you know, go, go, go elsewhere. Um, uh, Todd, you're very kind. Um, uh, I really appreciate your, your very kind comments there. Thank you. Um, uh, Philip, how about this title? 0 0.111 billion contract. Well, yeah, I, I don't think that would the zero would have really worked quite as well. But um, Hans is saying, Barbara is, is, is re patience is required. We all know it's for long-term holders. Yeah, I mean, I think just look at, you know, the, the Barba fundamental numbers. If you look on my, my Patreon, I've got, you know, Barba here. Uh, app. Let me just show you this. Um, uh, da, 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 da. where is it okay let's just look here at, at at some numbers just some basic numbers here's alibaba in yellow and then amazon facebook etc and just look at you know gross profit margins 43 percent uh return on common um equity almost 19 percent uh, those are pretty good numbers right they're like google type numbers uh, we have uh, 10 percent of capital is held in cash uh, we have uh, revenue growth forecast almost 40%. That's better than any any of the FANG stocks. So, you know, there are some pretty, you know, EBIT margins are 16%. Uh, that's pretty good stuff for an alleged retailer, right? So 
you know, I, I'm not saying you should hold it and hold on to it. It depends on your horizon. But for me, it is just something that eventually will bear fruit. Uh, but it might not this year. I think it's entirely possible. Um, uh, Cindy, you guys are very kind. Appreciate the kind comments. Uh, smash the like and the subscribe button, guys. Uh, that's the best best way to show your appreciation because it helps me with the algorithm. Uh, Muscle Dog wants to look at Tencent. We can definitely do that. We can have a quick look, guys. And if you just joined us, we'll do a Palantir roundup just in a second here as well. So Tencent is basically having a choppy time. And let me overlay Baba here. And you can see that it's not a Tencent problem, really. It's a... Um, can you see the orange chart here? That's Baba rather adequately colored, wouldn't you say, in the Baba uh, orange. So the whole sector is kind of trading like that. So it's, it's basically government regulatory worries that are hitting both stocks at the same time so you know they are moving um well not always i mean obviously barber is much lower than that but now as of late they are moving in tandem so since about um end of january early february they're moving together because the market realized all the stuff that was applied to barber in terms of regulation holding companies financial holding companies and all that stuff uh, 10 cents uh, also has to follow there um uh <laughs> muscle dog thanks very much um i, I don't mind the troll so much uh, how often should long-term holders ch check the stock charts says eric well eric i think at a minimum i would once a quarter listen to the earnings call because that will tell you whether something has fundamentally changed. Uh, that would be the, the minimum, I would say, but very hard to do to not look at a stock chart if you've invested in something, especially with all the apps and things we have on phones now. And, you know, if you watch me, I'll probably show you the chart. So be, you'd have to turn off for me for, for three months. Um, um, Okay, John. All right, you're 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 not happy today. Go, go go and make yourself a cup of coffee or something. Or you know, go for a walk, enjoy some sunshine, do something happy to cheer yourself up. A bit of meditation or something will go a long way. Um, David, you're right. Uh, looking at the stock chart all the time is not necessarily beneficial unless you're planning on buying regularly. So. I buy at least once a month. Um, I mean, actually, I buy definitely once a month, every single month on the same day. Um, but I do also have some funds tucked away if there is an opportunity. So I do look for those opportunities. That is just why I like looking at stock charts. Plus, I honestly quite just quite enjoy doing it. Uh, but if you are uh, you know, invested in two stocks and you find that you're watching it absolutely all day, every day, uninstall some of those apps from your phones, get alive and go and do something else. And, and you know, it's not going to go up. I was in a taxi the other day and the guy, the, the driver had in front of him, you know, half a dozen phones, which is quite common here. And one of them was his stock portfolio. And he was just refreshing, 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 refreshing at every traffic light. He was just doing that. He was doing that every second. And I was like, it's not going to go up because you do that, man. Take a chill pill. You know, and, and the way you can relax is by knowing that you've invested in good stocks. And the way you know that is you've done your fundamental research. You've read their financial statements. You've listened to their earnings call. You've made a discounted cash flow model. Yes, you've looked at momentum. You've looked at the chart and you've written down why you bought it and what you aim for the stock to do and what you aim and expect for their financials. And if that all sounds too difficult, well, you can either not do it and just live in the dark and buy stuff that other people are buying out of FOMO or, you know, follow some guru, but you always get the filing three months late. So it isn't the greatest strategy. Um, or uh, check out my course, guys. I teach you all of that. Uh, and it's absolutely zero risk to you because there's a 100% refund policy and you can, you can do it and you just feel much, much more confident. Like I invest in stocks, so they go up or down 10 or 20%. I'm like, yeah, I don't really care because... For me, it's a long-term thing because I know what that company is doing and whether the market overreacts. And if it goes down and the market overreacts, I see it as a buying opportunity rather than as something that freaks me out. So it gives you a lot of peace of mind. Um, why writing it down, Stefan? Because the emotion and the psychology of our mind is a problem. Say you bought Palantir, you know, uh, what about five months ago, if it is now down, you know, whatever it is, a substantial amount, the emotion of seeing that red number uh, takes over. 
and you no longer remember exactly why you bought it. You forget the thesis you had at the beginning. You forget what is your target? What's your exit plan? What's your strategy? At what prices are you buying? At what prices are you not buying? Um, all of that stuff gets clouded away because your mind has this sort of... You, people don't want to ever admit that they made a bad judgment or an, an error. Um, so that's one problem. People never sell things that are actually bad. Now, for something like Palantir, it's perhaps the opposite that's the problem, is that people overlook the positive reasons that they bought it for and that nothing's actually changed. But how do you know nothing has changed when you didn't write it down? Because your memory will play tricks on you. And what, you know, you bought something two years ago. Do you remember what you thought, why you bought it? You pretty much just remember, I thought it was a good company and, you know, my friend John buys it. And, and that isn't an investment thesis. So to avoid the tricks you, the mind plays on you, I give you some templates uh, and literally you can fill in uh, just the reasons why you bought it. And I, I give you some, 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 uh, some sort of tips and, and helper points to help you do that. And you print it out, you put it in a file or you stick it on the wall, which is what, what I prefer to do or on a fridge or something. And that way you have that easy reference when it goes up or down you can be like ah okay uh, now, now i know where i where i am so i absolutely uh, recommend that um <laughs> okay andrew i'm glad i'm glad you find it entertaining um and hans i i i, I totally i'm glad you're with me on that a written plan and a journal is very important for a powerful tool and it's you don't have to print it out i mean you can keep a little notebook um I, I like to print out little bits and i just cut them up and i stick them on a wall with a bit of uh, a blue painter's tape so it doesn't take the, the paint off um i like that writing down the reasons you purchase the companies as muscle doc um, and, and yes I, I truly recommend that muscle doc if you want to get the templates there over on my my course page for which there is a link below with a 39 percent off coupon code which expires on sunday guys so check that out um uh fr8 is asking a very interesting question here do you think china will let the u.s order their companies so you are hitting the nail on the head here that is this whole um U.S. Uh, holding foreign companies accountable act requires Chinese companies to disclose their audit papers to U.S. auditors within a time frame of three to five years. So there is no real urgency here. China, say, so I'm in here in Hong Kong, which obviously is part of China, but it's a separate jurisdiction. So the Hong Kong SEC equivalent, the stock exchange, didn't have access to mainland Chinese audits either until late December last year. They were given, given access. Um, and I think it's in China's interest and in their financial interest to come to some sort of compromise and disclose, you know, at, at least the um, important parts of those papers. Um, and it wouldn't really be a big hurdle because, you know, most of these companies that are Chinese that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, are already audited by, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers or something, but their Shanghai office, not their New York office. So you just have to find a, a, a way to bridge that gap. I think it's in everyone's interest. The U.S. financial industry wants Chinese IPOs and listings. They want those companies. They want that money. They want the fees. Uh, if they don't, if they close the door to all Chinese companies, the New York Stock Exchange becomes much, much smaller. And where does all the money go? It comes here to Hong Kong. So not really in a strategic interest of the market there either. Uh, so I think both sides, it's in their interest to figure it out. Um, it might take them some time, but I, I think I'm pretty confident they're going to figure that out because it's money. And both the Chinese and the US sides like money. So you know, they have something in common there. So I, I think it's going to get figured out. But as I say, the law has a, a three-year period in, in which that needs to get enforced. But the enforcement mechanism hasn't started yet. And the SEC said at some point last year that they are going to sit on their hands for two years. That was their proposal. And it seems that they're doing that because the law does not give a deadline by when the SEC needs to start looking at companies. So they can simply say, we haven't got a mechanism for looking at it, and that's what they said at the moment, so we're not doing anything at all. So there isn't an, an acute risk here, uh, but there is a, a long-term one. I appreciate you saying that. Um, uh, 
Uh, Robert, getting frustrated that the world isn't seeing lithium stocks properly while the fundamentals demand forecasts remain solid and the price of lithium continues to rise. Long-term investing, I suppose, Robert. Yeah, and you know what, Robert, the hardest thing is to, is to follow your research and your conviction when the market is going against you. When it turns around and the herd follows it, you ride the wave a little bit and then you jump out at least for part of it when, you know, when, when the herd is joined and that's where you make your money. Um, and I, I know, Robert, you are, you're on my, my course and that is exactly one of the psychology uh, lessons I, I, I teach in a little bit more detail than that. So you, I, I know you've done a tremendous amount of research, Robert, because you, know, you run a whole uh, channel on our Discord community, which I really truly appreciate here on raw materials. Um, and, and lithium prices are indeed... Um, near near all-time highs, I would say. They seem to have come, come down ever so slightly, at least in China. And we have all these te technologies coming out, sodium and all these things, but they're not quite ready yet, are they, Robert? And they are not as uh, powerful. They can't store as much. They might play a part of it, but the short term is still very, very much lithium. Uh, so um, I, I, my feeling on that one, Robert, is I, I, I've read most of your research. I, I think, I think it's, it's pretty solid. So I think we should get a reward at some point. Um, and Philip, you're absolutely right. Always listen to people who say the opposite of what you believe in, because it's the only way you, you get smarter. And that's why quite often I read sort of seeking alpha articles or you know things like that, I, that are saying the opposite of what I think, because you might just pick up that one little snippet, research it, and either it reconfirms your theory and your research, or it gives you something really interesting to think about. And I think the word conviction is a slightly dangerous one. And I think it's sort of Ark who coined it, uh, Kathy Woods, and I love them for th their transparency. But conviction does not mean making a decision one time and sticking with it forever. That's not what smart investment is. You have to revisit it when the facts change. And for that, you have to look at the facts and not exclude potentially negative facts you know otherwise you're just living in you know this sort of a, a la la land really um fr8 yeah the china hustle there is a there is a program out like that i mean Look, I think, look at the numbers, do your own research. There are a lot of documentaries out there that are, uh, are, are nothing but uh, clickbait. Um, Sandal Growers are looking very good today. You know what? I was going to record a video on that. I actually have some notes here on my desk just before this, but I ran out of time. So I, I, I might still do that. Well, I'll probably put it out tomorrow. Um, yeah, running up a lot on speculation. The underlying business is changing from a cannabis business to essentially a um, an investment in the kind of cannabis space business, their cannabis operations are horrible. They're losing money all the time. It's just, it's just a terrible business. Their investments are making money. So maybe they're going to convert to an investment vehicle. That might be the more sensible thing to do. Now, Palantir is up now 5.95% or 6% as it refreshes here. So still up very, very nicely here. Um, uh, Mark is saying, do we uh, focus on other stocks uh, apart from Palantir Neo Barber on the Discord channel? Uh, yes, of course we do. We don't just look at these. Um, you can see here, for example, of course, there are some of the car companies. There's Tencent, there's BlackBerry. We look at defensive stocks, dividend tax stocks, value stocks, um, some Chinese stocks. We look at cryptos. We look at space, raw materials, semiconductors, AI, fintech, gaming. And quite frankly, that list is growing every week because more and more members are joining and they have different interests. Uh, and then of course we keep adding to that. So uh, no, I, I'm not a sort of a one tune band. I think all good companies are interesting. It doesn't really matter to me what sector or what geography uh, they are in. Uh, but thank you, Mark, for that question. Um, come and come and check it out if you, if, if you like uh, the uh, Discord community. I think it's a really good one because so many of you guys who are also on this live chat here, you share actual research, you share news, and no one ever posts really like, oh, I just bought this and just, you know, rockets and stuff like that. Yes, we have some fun and we share some private things also. There's nothing wrong with that, but it isn't one of these sort of Reddit channels where everyone is just you know, banging the same drum. Um, uh, a spirit child, um, thank you for your comment there. Sandal is getting a meme stock boost. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they always have, look at the volume here. Can you see the volume? 123 million shares traded. Uh, always tremendous volume. 
Um, Roger says, I own the lit ETF for a while, but there's not much room to grow at this point. Uh, yeah, there are these two um, battery ETFs. One is called lit, one is called bat, B-A-T-T. Um, both reasonable plays, I think, but perhaps not. I think you might have a point that there isn't that much room to grow for the actual lithium companies. Uh, I think the mining is perhaps the more interesting one, but it's also the more risky one. I think one has to take that into account. Um... Michael is saying, do you see us leaving Denver in the near future? Sorry, who's, who's leaving Denver? Denver? Uh, um, um, okay, Robert is saying that lit is not a good investment, bad stocks, no research. It's just a, like a, a sort of catch-all, isn't it? Um, Sandal Grow is moving very good today, 10% up, good volume. They always have this insane volume every day. Um, uh, Robert's saying, join the Discord, guys. Yes, and you should do that, guys, and you can do it. It's 50 cents a day, uh, and they are still... Look, they have five spots available, so that's a special offer. If you join it uh, for, for the year, you get another month off as well. Um, uh, and, this, I mean, just, just check it out. W what's the risk, really? So uh, let me just go through some of these questions here. I appreciate you guys. I'm sorry, I'm reading off my phone here. It's the only way I can see your questions today. Um uh, CH is saying, how do these meme stock Reddit kids coordinate and select which stocks to inflate and then destroy? Well, I mean, there are obviously Reddit groups on that, but it isn't just that. There are also a lot of, um, not serious is the wrong word, but professional investors. There are a lot of funds and banks and, and institutions in on this, and they are using this as a, as a, as a, uh, as a way to making uh, some serious money here. Um, uh, IPOE is going to trade uh, next Tuesday. Any comments on it? So I, did a video, I put a video out on that, which was, I was relatively harsh on the stock. Okay, the company is a good company. The product is a good product. Their customers seem to love it. I was hoping they would have much better margins. I was disappointed by their margins. That's, that's really, I think, the way I would sum it up in a nutshell. Maybe that's going to improve. Maybe it won't. I, I, for me, it is... I don't know. I, for me, it's a relatively risky thing to invest in when there are a lot of things I can invest in that are a lot less risky. It might give me the same return. So um, when I see these kind of stock charts to start with, I slightly shudder because things that have been up at $28 and now are at 19 after a massive rally uh, are somewhat scary because there is a lot of irrationality in there. And I prefer my stocks a little bit more rational. I like my stocks to act somewhat on the underlying numbers. And so far, we don't quite see that. Why? Because it's coming out of a SPAC and it's a problem in the long run that gets forgotten. Uh, but I just, you know, look at, look at the the margin numbers and just compare them to a bank. And I appreciate banks have some advantages, but given that their overheads are so low, I don't really get where they are, are not making those margins. Um, uh, Oscar is asking, how much money do, 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 uh, does Palantir need to add to have a good quarter? Okay, the uh, if you look at... Uh, the expectation is my discounted cash flow model, which of course is also on the on the Patreon here. Um, by the end of the year, we need to have about 1.5 billion in revenue. So 1.5 divided by four, you need to add 375 million revenue a, a month. Uh, so this was a very good contract, right? This is, gets us like to uh, you know almost a third of the way there. Um, Tesla is dying. Well, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. I don't think Tesla is dying. Let's pull up Tesla. Uh, Tesla did get a shot in the arm from, or will get a shot in the arm from, from Biden on, uh, you know, they are going to give them those tax, tax credits. They're going to apply again to, to uh, companies that have sold more than 200,000 cars. So it's, it's trending down a little bit here. Um, chip shortage. I, I, I would say that's the best way of summing it up. I don't think there's any real news out on um, on Tesla here uh, that really affects things. Um, what's that here? Consumer reports drops top picks for Tesla Model 3. Okay, I mean, that doesn't really matter, does it? Loses top pick status. I mean, who cares, really? So... No, I don't think it's any real news. I mean, look, it's it's a it's a movement of of, of minus one percent. I really wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Um, uh, 
Uh, Robert is asking about trading bots. So trading bots are basically somewhat AI powered bots. So you have, sometimes you have the very high frequency traders who can cause havoc because they can do things that we can't do. Um, if they are automated, they take profits or do actions on the basis of what uh, perhaps what technical analysis tells you. So it's a little bit like the ETF effect, right? If something gets sold off, the ETFs have to adjust, they have to keep selling off and it makes the market more volatile. Or think of it as, as margins. If, 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 say if Tesla goes down 25%, all the guys who bought Tesla on margin are forced to sell. So it makes the sell off worse. So these bots by acting on some sort of program uh, tend to make the market more volatile. Uh, I think that's perhaps the easiest explanation there. What site are you using, says Dan? Um, the charts here, that's tradingview.com, guys. It's absolutely free. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best charting softwares out there, so to check it out. Uh, Michael, thank you very much here for your support. Um, keep it up with the, the dumbbells. Um, Uh, the Consumer Report has its biggest donations from the Ford Foundation. Oh my, a surprise. Think, think why they read rubbish on Tesla always. It, you know, publications uh, tend to have uh, a, an advertiser or a paymaster somewhere, so I really don't think that matters. Uh, Ford is doing a pretty good job marketing their F-150. There was a, a video out today also on YouTube. I saw another one, uh, some really big influencers and stuff. So it looks like a decent car. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm sure they're going to sell them. I'm sure Ford lovers are going to buy the Ford. But it isn't the most revolutionary technology. I think it's basically just, and apologies, guys, if you love your Fords, I think it's basically taking an ICE and just changing the engine. Uh, and that's a little bit, I think, where these guys miss a trick. Uh, and that's where companies like Tesla and Neo really started from scratch, were able to do something a little bit different. So... Um, um, Yon Chu is a time traveler. Okay, you guys are talking about uh, uh, options for January 2022. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It is, of course, a, a, a there's a risk in it, but um, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm sure John uh, Yon rather knows what he's doing. Um, so, so guys, let's do a, do a quick, if you just joined us, guys, quick quick recap here. Palantir got that 111 million special forces contract which is a big deal um, they have of course uh, gotten contracts from the special ops command lots of them over the years i pulled that up for you as well these are all 25 contracts so far from the u.s special operations command but the biggest i can find so far was 51 million in 2018 i think there was another 52 million again in 2018 so that's about what we're talking about here it's those kind of contracts sizes um let me see, was, it, was there a bigger one? No, I think that was, a, that was about the biggest one we've had. So this is a substantial contract. Why? Well, Palantir's revenue last year was, was about 1.1 billion. So this is basically 10% of revenue. It matters. And it's sticky and it's great because it just means that the trust and the faith and how deeply they are now in embedded with the US Defense Department is, is pretty much irreversible. So this is this is great revenue and this is great predictable revenue uh, going forward. Robert is saying 220 viewers and only 75 likes. Guys, smash that like button. It truly helps and you have no idea how much it helps because it tells the YouTube algorithm, hey, what these guys, this guy's videos are pretty good. Let's show them to somebody else. And that, of course, it helps me a great deal. So I appreciate that. Michael Hardy, welcome here to Portland. Um, Vladimir, great to see you. I'm very, very well. It's lovely to see you on the chat here. Vladimir is our viewer with the uh, the driest and best sense of humor of Vladimir. So thank you for always joining and keeping us entertained, especially on the live calls. So let's do a quick market recap here. Uh, let me just hit refresh on this, make sure we're looking at the, the best thing here. So everything's looking pretty green, um, including orange juice and coffee, which is always very important. Um, pretty much everything's up, right? I mean, unless you invested in wheat, which is probably not really the case for most of you. Uh, everything is looking pretty good. The economic numbers we got out today were, were pretty good. Um, income was down a little bit less than we were expecting. Um, inflation overall looks like it might not be you know, as bad as we thought, at least from the Michigan five-year inflation expectations. Uh, and then the more short-term inflation expectations were bang on on target. We are going to get 
the president's 2022 budget today. That's going to be a whopper. Uh, so there'll be billions and trillions uh, thrown at all sorts of things. And a lot of it will be thrown at EVs. So watch that space. That's going to be good for the EV sector. Um, Efran, thank you very much. Um, Anita, yes, you're quite right. Great of you to join us. Um, uh, it, it is indeed trading view. That's the that's what I used there. And let's have a quick run through all our favorite stocks here. Uh, BlackBerry absolutely flying. I think that's sort of meme stock behavior at 11%. Uh, sorry, Philco. And PDD up very nicely. Sundial, that's also in the in the meme stock territory. Nothing really fundamental there. Uh, Palantir up. Almost 5%. We were up at 8%, but we're still holding something quite nicely here. E-Hang up on the news. They have a long-term, a longer distance drone out. And then the rest of the market just looking slightly green because inflation isn't as bad as we thought. The guys selling off are, well, GameStop and SOS. No one really ever knows. Um, Hillian, I'm not a huge fan of on coin. Basically, uh, Bitcoin is at 36,800. So that explains coin, it moves with it. It's basically another equity indicator for, for Bitcoin. And then we have Tesla. I'm not really sure why they're down 1%. Maybe it's because they're not unionized and the, well, uh, so the, the at the moment there is a 7,500 US dollar tax credit, right? And Tesla isn't getting that anymore because that's capped at 200,000 cars. Now they're gonna remove that cap they're going to throw in an extra two and a half thousand for US made, and they're going to throw in an extra in, on top of that another two hundred thousand and two and a half thousand US dollars for unionized companies. So as in for uh, the guys who voted for Biden, right? Um, that's him saying thank you for getting me elected. Yeah, that's the most positive spin you can put on it, and Tesla won't get that. But it's only two and a half thousand US dollars, so. Because Ford and GM get an extra two and a half thousand US dollars, will they make better EVs? Mm, probably not. Uh, so I, I don't think it really matters in the long run. Neo is sitting here pretty much at zero. Um, VIX is at zero, which is good. Volatility, we don't want it. And QQQ up half a percent here. Barber up a little bit. Uh, PayPal up a little bit. So the market's having a pretty happy green day here, guys. Um, uh, ben Levy, can you make videos explaining your process for making DCF models? I have been, uh, and thank you for asking. Uh, it is on my course. There is a 39% off coupon code down below, which is freedom, standing for financial freedom for you. And actually have it up here, literally the very, very lecture, uh, which tells you exactly how to do it. On the right, you have the template that I give you. On the left, you have an income statement in for Tesla in this example. And I show you where you can get that data, uh, how you can and which bits you put into the model template, and then what you get and what the assumptions are and how it all works. It isn't difficult, honestly, it isn't, uh, but you need to spend a little bit of time to understand it. So if you're interested in that, uh, Ben, join my course. I teach you that and much, 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 much more. Uh, so I, I encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, there is a whole uh, page here within the link below which shows you all the things that I teach you uh, from discounted cash flows to technical analysis to inflation investing to how to really make plans, how to understand all the macro and the micro indicators, what happens, uh, how to understand the market psychology or the herd behavior. And again, how to make money out of all of those things because that's really what matters. So so, so check that out, guys. Um, I, I, it's uh, so far an incredibly happy community, which is why there is a completely no questions asked um, refund policy. Um, uh, Ford is made in Mexico, so the money for them there as well. Uh, Lightning will be made in Detroit, so it counts, uh, says uh, Is Isander, as Isiander there. Uh, thank you very much for that. I mean, the question is always with origin. Um, the rules of origin typically are you have to make a substantial alteration or a substantial value add. So that could be relatively basic. So you could assemble more or less your car in Mexico, you could bring it to the US. Now the battery is one of the most expensive parts. You could put that in it and put the wheels on it. I'm not saying that's the full explanation, but that might make the product made in the United States. It's a little bit like garments, right? You ship them in from somewhere, uh, you then stitch on the seams, put the buttons on, you've added value, it becomes a, a made in Italy or US or wherever product. So you know, just because there is a factory somewhere else, it doesn't mean 
you don't technically comply with the rules of origin. They are a lot more complicated than most people, what most people think. So um, there might still be a, be a way for them to, to, to get, some, get their hands on some of that money. Um, 11,000 on Tuesday, Adam. Sorry, Adam, I don't quite know what you're talking about. Uh, Chico saying, why you change your title? Why did I change my title? Oh, you mean uh, from uh, the, the, the video before, for what we're watching? Well, I put these sometimes out a day or two in advance to schedule them so people um, know, know about the schedule. And then, you know, something big happens, uh, like the Palantir contract happened literally uh, in, in, in an hour before. Uh, I thought it was an interesting uh, thing to talk about. So, um, Issy Anda, thanks you very much, guys. Now, if you have any questions, now's the time to shout it out. Um, the market is up here still very nicely. Pal Palantir. Let's have a quick look at our Palantir stock again. And, and again, guys, technical analysis, it's pretty useful for uh, seeing where we are and, and timing your entries and exits. So again, it's something I encourage you to understand. And of course, I teach that in my course. So what we can see here today, obviously, we have this lovely rally up to 2477, which was great because it was above our previous peak, but now we are coming back down here. So uh, what happens, therefore, is that the 2477, was that what it was today? 2475, uh, that will become a resistance point. So let me just put that flag in here. Um, that's that's a real basic that one there for a technical analysis. So. Uh, Let's see where we end up on the day. Uh, Robert is saying CNBC 90 minutes ago, Morningstar warns about thematic tech investing popularized recently by Kathy Wood. And I'm with that on some, some front. You know, there are tech companies out there that are just not that great, whose tech isn't that great, who haven't got a moat, who haven't made money, who might never make money, who are valued at very, very high levels. Not saying they're necessarily the ones that, that Kathy Woods invest in, but uh, there are definitely a, a healthy uh, or unhealthy number of, of tech stocks out there that I think you know, are not worth um, very much at all in the long run. Michael is saying, I'm not sure how to phrase my question. By looking at institutional investor purchases, is this a glimpse of what is going on in the dark pools in the rears? Well, OK, so they have to disclose their trades, but far too late, right? The US regulation is pretty lenient to them, so it's maybe 45 days after the quarter. It depends a little bit on what sort of fund they are. So anyway, it's pretty late. They bought it on the 1st of January. You find out in April, right, or in May. Not particularly useful in that sense, because you know, what does it tell you, really? Um, they could have, on the 1st of April, sold it all, and you wouldn't know until sometime in July, right? So how, how useful is this information? Um, by the way, the, the company that tracks all of the trades on the New York Stock Exchange for the SEC to look for insider trading and dodgy stuff is Palantir, right? They, they use Palantir software for that. So, you know, is it dark? Well, we, we don't know about it, right? So it's kind of, it's frustrating. I wish, and that's why I like ARC for, they disclose every single day all of their trades, and I get an email every day, bang, I see what they've done. And that's transparency. They, of course, also do that because they're using that to help move the market in their direction because they've grown so big. But I think everybody should do that. We should have complete transparency, and then we would know at least on the day after, ah, okay, yesterday, JP Morgan did this, UBS did that, this fund did that. But they don't want that because they like to do things in the dark. They like to buy in a way that even their competitors don't find out until they've done their deals. So I think we could do with a lot more transparency. Is it likely? Probably not. No, I think the uh, US financial industry is as too much clout there with whoever is uh, is in the White House. So no, I, I don't think that's that is very very likely. Um, let me just see what we get here. Um, Andrew, you're asking, uh, you're very kind, you're asking on Patreon for a link to the course. Absolutely. Well, actually, it is literally in the description of any of my videos. And if I'm not mistaken, it's Felix Friends forward slash course. Uh, but Andre, I will, I will send you that as well. Um, let me see where it is. Uh, where is the... Yeah, so this is obviously not the greatest link in the world, but I think you type in course. 
Okay, I'll um, hang on. Let's pull up any old YouTube video of mine. You're going to see me on the screen again and again. Okay, we, we can watch ourselves watching ourselves live. Now, isn't that exciting? So you see down here in the description, uh, the master stocks course here, felixandfriends.org stocks. Andrew, I know you're on the live chat here. You click on that and that will get you to the right page. Um, right, guys, let me just make this a little bit bigger again here. Um, uh, Michael, thank you very much for your question. William's asking, what's the most unique feature of the Palantir product? Ah, Andrew, there you are. Uh, great. Um, the, um, uh, have a great day too, Michael. Michael, the most uh, unique feature of the Palantir product really is there seems to be nobody else who is able to pull together lots of data sources. And think about it, okay? If you worked, ever worked in any major corporation, they have always acquired companies, right? So, uh, for example, I, as a lawyer, was seconded to an infrastructure company for a while, one of the biggest contractors in Europe, I don't know, 120,000 staff or something. So they had like their main IT system and about a dozen legacy systems that they acquired with the acquisitions. And they were all sort of tied together with a bit of rope and string. Um, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But you didn't really have full access to any of that data. So what Palantir can do is they can pull up all of that data out of those separate pools and put it into one operating system. That's really what it is. It's an operating system and show you in a visual way the data so that a layman, an untrained person like you and me can use and interpret that data. So your salespeople can use it, your management can use it, of course, also your IT people can use it, but that's the beauty of it. So it's making taking something very complicated from lots of sources and putting it into one place in a way that can be analyzed through the AI in a way that shows you real, direct, usually financial benefits if it's in the commercial space. So that's really what's, what's, what's very powerful about this. Um, and no one else really seems to do that. Um, Lily, welcome here. Um, question, while looking at the lifelong chart of a stock, can you explain why at one point in time it was worth hundreds of dollars, but now it's only worth a few dollars, says Anthony. Well, that typically means there's something pretty horrible that happened to the company, unless it's stock splits. But you know, most of the time, it just means that there is something really bad that happened to the company. So, for example, look at most, um, you know, look at most airlines, right? I, I don't really know an example here, but um, uh, what's a good airline? Um, or, or, you know, they're all bad airlines in, in my view. But if you look at anything kind of... Um, industrial uh, Ford I think might be might be a good example for example if you look at Ford go on a say a weekly chart and just go back in time uh, I don't actually know very much about Ford because I, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole but uh, there we go okay here we have the sort of chart you're talking about right Ford at one point in the 1990 was at $19 and now with this incredible rally just at 15 but you know we've been down in the seven six dollars what does that mean it just means it's a terrible business the market has told you over a long period of time this business is so bad that even with taking into account inflation it is now worth less than it was 20 years ago um, and you then have to look at why that is. And with Ford, I can tell you is that the um, revenue is incredibly volatile. Uh, revenue has risen at the same time as revenue has risen. Their margins have gotten worse or at least unpredictable and their debt level has piled up. So growth with more debt and less profitability uh, equals run. Uh, that, that's what it means to me. So, you know, there are just there are a lot of businesses that are just terrible, uh, but they keep getting bailed out. They keep getting propped up, debt is virtually free, uh, they're unionized, you know, they're getting thrown uh, bits of money here and there by the government, and so they stick around. But that doesn't mean that the products they make are bad, I'm not saying that, it doesn't mean that the people who work there are bad, it is, just means it's a bad business, um, and quite possibly a bad management, at least over the time period. So, you know, the, the stock price in the long run tells you uh, whether the company is performing or not. Uh, Lily uh, is asking about um, N NVIDIA. Yes, NVIDIA is doing a stock split, uh, which is coming up. With, uh, uh, I don't actually know the date at the top of my head, but this should tell me. 
Uh, da, da, da. When is it? When is it happening? Some of you guys probably know. Shout it out if you know. I haven't got it up here at the moment. But yeah, they're doing a stock split. Um, does that mean the stock's gonna gonna collapse? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, but it, the actual value doesn't doesn't change. So uh, if you do a stock split and you do have twice the numbers of stocks, your individual stock is worth half. But in your portfolio two times more stocks show up. So it makes absolutely no difference. It just means that it's a little bit easier to trade and it is sort of psychologically a little bit more uh, more attractive. Um, airline, Thai Airways. Okay, I, I don't know if I can pull that up. We don't want to be mean to the to the Thais because it is, it's all airlines. It isn't just Thai Airways. But yeah, here is a good, it's a typical example of an airline that was um, in... If you'd bought this in 2004, you would have spent $50 on it. Now it's worth three. So spin this however you like. You could blame it on COVID. No, you cannot because it hasn't performed in the first couple of years. It has it's never performed and it probably never will. Why is it still around? Because governments like to have a national carrier, so they bail them out. And that's what happens. All of these businesses, British Airways, Thai, Lufthansa, uh, they should all be out of business. They should all be closed. But by some bizarre miracle, uh, they get recapitalized. Uh, some people lose all their money and then they start all over again. And that's just the airline business. Uh, it is absolutely bizarre. I have no idea where anybody would ever buy an airline stock. But uh, here we are. You have me ranting. Actually, I like what Ford is doing and they did not get bailed out, says Carmeno. Okay, but they keep getting, you know, this 5,000 US dollars for US made unionized companies per car, EV sold. Uh, you know, what's that all about? That is a subsidy, right? So, you know, they, they are getting subsidies. The US government buys a huge amount of Fords and those kind of things. So it might not be a direct bailout, but it's an indirect bailout of, in, in some sort. Um, and I mean, I think, yeah, good cars quite possibly. But look at the financials. It's just, it's, it's hideous. Um, NFTs in China, says Brian here. I would be careful with that in, if, you, if, you, if you are looking at the Chinese space only. I think they'll do well in the art space, uh, but given the restrictions and the unfriendliness towards crypto in China, um, that might not really fly all that much. So on the high-end art space, on the really super rare stuff, yes, I think there's a lot of money to be made with that. But on a sort of smaller retail level, um, I, I don't think China is the market for that. Um, so guys, on that note, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. I truly appreciate you all joining in. Uh, come over, join our Discord community. It's only 50 cents a day, guys. You pay for an advance. You get a month off as well. It's a beautiful community. You can ask me questions anytime, day or night. Uh, as you just saw when Andrew asked me a question, I get the messages popping up on my phone, uh, which is uh, is useful. But of course, there's also a really fantastic community there. So check that out, guys. Uh, also check out my course. Uh, lots and lots and lots to learn there. Um, you deserve to invest in yourself and make yourself smarter, more successful, confident, calmer and happier investors. And that's what I promise you in my course. So check it out, guys. Links below 39% coupon code expires on Sunday. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Truly appreciate all of you for smashing the like button or your comments and questions. You make this community, guys. And the more than 20,000 of you who've hit subscribe, I truly, truly appreciate that. Um, I wish you a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. And I'll look forward to seeing you on the next video.